And if you have your Bible or if you have your device, uh, just make sure you are using that for the Bible only, okay? Um, unless you're, of course, using your Greek lexicon. That's, that's fine if you have that. Greek lexicon. Right. Um, so let's see here. Uh, to get us rolling, uh, Cameron, would you open us in prayer tonight as we get into the Word? Dear Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity to come back together. Um, and so many around the world cannot. Um, I thank you for the opportunity we have to um, laugh at people and um, to listen to Pastor Heinz tonight to um, for the good teaching from your word. I ask that you would help us to uh, listen carefully as Pastor Heinz uh, goes to the end of John chapter 13, that we would take away something that we would just not think on what else has happened today, but that we would pay, um, give our full attention to Pastor Hines as he speaks, and I ask that uh, we have a good rest of the night. Amen. Amen. Thank you. As we get started tonight, I'll do this necessarily very often, okay? I want you to identify a person in your mind, okay? Identify someone who either you don't really like, or you don't really get along with, or is just plain annoying. Don't look at that person, okay? Um, but in your mind, Ident identify. Okay, we. I think we probably, for the most part, right? There's some of us who we don't dislike anyone, or we don't get annoyed by. Anyone. But we can probably, probably all of us in here, there are someone, someone that you struggle with. Okay, because we, we all have them. Okay, I, I, I get it. Um, all right. Raise your hand if you have identified a specific person. <laughs> just, just pick one. Just pick one person. <laughs> Do I only have the big one? Okay. All right. Next. Okay. The point being, um, the point being, okay, that uh, you know, no matter how many friends you have, or how many people you like, or um, you know, the fact that maybe you get along with just about everybody, it's fairly evident that there's somebody out there who it fits into that category of some sort. Either we struggle to get along. Or they're just very annoying, or they're very frustrating, or you know, for for people are hard to get along along with. Um, maybe you don't. There's someone that is hard to like because maybe they're arrogant, or maybe they are. Maybe they're just mean, and it's, maybe they're just a mean person, right? Uh, or maybe maybe they're hypocritical, um, or maybe they are. Maybe it's that that kid at school. Who is nice to your face, but then will actually kind of stab you in the back. And maybe they might gossip about you behind your back, and you know that. Like we all we all know people who are, to put it plainly, maybe are hard to love. Um, and I think we all we all realize we started in last week on Jesus, you know, his final teaching here. Uh, as he's in, in the upper room with the disciples. I think we all realize that we're supposed to show love. And it's not, it's not a feeling, right? It's actually action. Love is action. And, but to be honest, like we all identify people, specific people to us, and my hand was up too. It's Luke, by the way. He's the one I struggle with. Um, you probably guessed that. Um, but we all have those people that they are hard to love. They're just, they're, they're difficult. It's difficult to love that person. And now here's the thing that we have to reconcile. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how that person treats us, what type of person they are, what they've done to us in the past, how many times they've done whatever to us. It doesn't matter. In this, 
this setting of the Last Supper. You remember back to last week, Jesus has this final opportunity to spend with just his disciples. It's his, it's his final words, it's his most important words to him. And he's done this, uh, this, this demonstration of showing love. And he's teaching. Okay, so he's demonstrating, serving, lovingly serving. And then he's teaching on what he just did. Um, what was, by the way, let's recap real quick. Uh, if I had an extra Christmas tree, I'd give it to person. You could tell me, um, what, was the, what was the point of Jesus washing the disciples' feet? Why did he use that illustration? And, and we want to take a crack at it. Eli? Because it was the lowest servant's job. His lowest servant's job. And so the point being, someone, someone pushed the point a little farther along here. The point being what? Okay, and let's even and, and even let's let's push it a little bit farther, and that you have the ultimate highest being in the universe who puts himself down at the lowest level to show love. And so, to take a little farther, his point then for the disciples and for us is that if God can do that, then why can't we do that? And so he's gonna he's gonna continue talking about love. That's, that's the, the topic tonight. But it's, it's actually sandwiched in, be, in between a couple of hard predicaments with hard people. Okay? Let's, um, here's, so here's where, what Jesus says about love. Uh, I won't make anyone stand and read it, but could someone read uh, somewhere in chapter 13, verses 33, 34, and 35? 33 through 35. Eli, you already answered it. And you ate a lot of sugar. Do you read that nice and loud? You can stand if you want to, but you don't have to. Chapter 13, verses 33 through 35. Uh, little children, yet a little, while I am with you. You shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say unto you, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love, you love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have love, if you have love one to another. Okay. Thank you. So there's, we're, we'll come back to this. We're actually going to come back to these verses at the end. But I want us to look at what is all around these verses. Okay. So as Jesus has has he's he's, moved, he's, he's going through this uh, teaching on love and loving service. And he, he, he transitions here for a little bit. And what I think what John wants us to see here, I think what Jesus wants us to see as well, and he wanted his disciples to see this in hindsight, is Jesus' knowledge of Judas' betrayal. So Judas has been sitting here this whole time. We, we touched on that a little bit last week. That Jesus washed Judas' feet, just like any of the other disciples. And so... The first thing that Jesus starts to, he, he, he starts to allude to that there's a traitor in the midst. Okay, so look at verse 18. That's where we pick up tonight. He says, I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, that the scripture may be fulfilled. He quotes out of Psalms. He that, he that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Someone who's dining with me, sharing a meal with me, is about to stomp on me, is the idea. And, and now, what's, what's the reason that Jesus tells him this? He says in verse 19. Okay, he says, Now I tell you, before it come, that when it is come to pass, he may believe that I am he. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me. And he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. Let's pause there real quick. Because verse 20 almost seems like a little bit out of place because he's talking about Judas betraying him. And he says that, you know, the reason that he's telling them this is so that they can look back and say, hey, G Jesus told us that Judas was going to betray him. And so, and then uh, his statement there in verse 20, here's, I believe, what Jesus' point is. As he says all this, it's because he doesn't want the disciples' faith to be shaken by, Jesus, by Judas' betrayal. Okay? So that's, he, he's, I believe this is for, for the disciples to, to remember this in hindsight.
insight. He even says that in verse 19. He says, I tell you uh, before it comes to pass, uh, so that when this happens, ye may believe that I am he. And, and really so the disciples can still have confidence in their role that Jesus has, has given them of, of starting the church okay, and spreading the gospel. So there's a lot that we could go uh, deeper into here. But look then, then down at verse 21. It says, when Jesus had said thus, he was troubled in spirit. Jesus is troubled. And he testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. So Jesus, he announces that there's a traitor in their midst, that someone's going to betray him. We'll talk about, talk about why he brings this up, because uh, it spends a lot of time here. Okay, so Jesus announces that, that there's a traitor. He doesn't say who it is. We have to think about that. That it says that Jesus, his spirit was troubled. I believe it's this, this aspect that this that Judas betrayal was not just like, oh, you know, Ju Judas betrayed him. That Judas is one of the disciples who's been with him, ministering, who whose belief in Jesus has drawn back over time and has shifted. And he's already put things into motion to betray Jesus. And I think that's that's hard for Jesus to, to experience this, to experience this betrayal. Now, the interesting thing, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but the disciples, they, when Jesus says this, it, like, it strikes the disciples. And it's honestly it's such a striking statement that it says the disciples actually doubt Jesus. Verse 22 says, Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. And then the next several verses, this is this is a scenario where all the disciples are like asking, "Who is it? Who is it?" And, you know, Peter says to, to John in uh, in verse uh, twenty-three through twenty-five, he says, "Hey, John, ask ask Jesus, who is it?" And then Jesus actually actually says in verse twenty-six, he says, "He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it." Uh, and when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. So the disciples are, are they, they, they cannot figure out who Jesus is talking about, which again shows you like how, how masked Judas was, how hypocritical he was. The disciples don't, don't suspect him at all. Like they're wondering, who could it be? Out of all of us in this room, who could it be? And so then, again, doesn't that make his betrayal that much more vicious? So Jesus, he actually, when, when John asked him that, he says, uh, he it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop in verse 26, he gave it to Judas. And somehow the, the disciples, they miss Jesus' action. They, they miss that. Now John remembers it in hindsight here. Or maybe he even observed it at the time. But I don't know, it didn't click. It didn't click. Now here's, here's where it gets... Uh, I don't know, just, there's so much more going on here. It says, after the sop, Satan entered into, into Judas. Then said Jesus unto him, that thou doest, do quickly. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake unto him. Okay, so they, they realize that, okay, Judas is the one who carries the money, and so maybe Jesus is sending him on an errand, or they say that he's supposed to go give something to the poor. Uh, and so they, they don't know what Jesus means. In verse 30, it says, Then uh, he then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. So Judas leaves. And then here's what Jesus says in these next several verses. It says, Therefore, when he was gone out, and now it's just Jesus and the eleven, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. And if God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway or immediately glorify him. Now, there's a lot, a lot going on there, a lot going on. But here's here's how we can look at verses 30 through 32: is that Judas has now gone out, and he has crossed that threshold, and he even says that Satan has entered into him. And so Judas has now crossed that threshold of, of 
his betrayal of Jesus is put into motion now. And so, but it's not so much, yes, it's, it's Judas' betrayal, but this is in, we have to remember, this is in the scope of God's plan, and that's what Jesus is saying here. This is all happening in the scope of God's plan. So God's plan is, is now put into motion, it's put into action. Okay, and the statements that he says there in verse 31 and 32, he says, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. So Jesus, Jesus is essentially saying, God's plan is put into motion. God the Father is going to be glorified, and God, and God the Son, Jesus, is going to be glorified, both now and into eternity. The, the, the crucifixion and that whole scenario has now started rolling. God's plan is in motion. And so God is using, think about that, God is using the deception and the selfishness of Judah's heart to play a part in, in God's redemption of mankind. So, all right, now we've read verses 35, 33 through 35, so we'll come back to those in a minute. Um, but I also want you to see here, because think about, okay, there's all this interaction surrounding Judas, okay? I want to take us to another aspect of the difficulty of, of loving others. And that's seen in, in, in Jesus' interaction with Peter. Now, we would hope, if you remember back to last week, we would hope that, that Peter would kind of simmer down after the whole foot-washing conversation and everything that Peter was saying, that whole back and forth that he and Jesus had. And Jesus kind of had to put Peter back into his place a little bit. But it's almost like Peter feels like he has to like reassert himself in Jesus' eyes and, and, and show how committed he is. And what he forgets is that Jesus knows exactly how committed he is. So, we saw Jesus' knowledge of Judas. Let's see his, his knowledge of Peter. Look at verse 36. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, oh, where are you going? Whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Where I go, thou canst follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. So, I put it like this. Is that in, in Peter's question here, Jesus, in his response, Jesus prompts Peter to, to have patience, to have faith. Peter wants to know where Jesus is going because Jesus keeps on alluding to he's not going to be there any longer. He's not going to be around. Okay? He said that to the Jews, and now he said it again to the disciples. We'll go back to those verses in a moment. Jesus says, you'll follow me in time. He says, you, where I go now, you can't follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. I believe Jesus means that, Peter, you're going to follow me. He's going to follow in ministry. Peter is going to die for Christ someday. And Peter will follow Christ into eternity. Okay, but Peter, of course, like he, he, everything's in the moment for him. And look at verse 37. Peter said unto him, Lord, why can't I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Okay. What Peter says here is good, right? Peter's talking, like he's talking about commitment. Hey, why can't I follow you now? I would, Lord, I would die for you, is what Peter says. And like that's that's good, right? But when Jesus, well, let's let's read how Jesus responds. Because Peter says, I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down my lay down thy life for my sake? I tell you the truth, the, the rooster won't crow until you have denied me three times. So Jesus is prompting Peter to, to slow down and think about what he's saying. And instead, Peter's like, no, 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 Lord, I'm, I'm so committed to you. I would die for you. And it's really, it's a, little, it's a bit misguided because, you know, is it true that Peter's committed to Jesus? Is Peter committed to Jesus? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does Peter know how committed he is to Jesus? No. He doesn't know what's going to happen. He's not as committed as he thinks. And the, the hard thing is, is that not far from now, Peter is going to see exactly how committed he is to Jesus. Or rather, how uncommitted he is. And so here's, think about this. Peter doesn't know where his own level of commitment is at. 
what Jesus does. And that's why Jesus says this to him. You're not as committed as you think. And that's why Jesus, he gives that little preview. And you're not as committed as you think. You're going to deny me. It's going to be like a, a, a different form of, of Judas betrayal. And Peter's not so much of a betrayal as it is just denial. But it's similar. So let's go back to verse 33 through 35, and let's focus on those uh, just for a moment. Because in the middle of all that, in the middle of all those interactions, Jesus picks back up on this, this lesson of love. And here's the thing. Okay, we talked about this uh, we talked about this last week, okay? And now Jesus is bringing up the same point again. So it's a repetitive lesson, right? Jesus, Jesus is saying, this is all part of the same conversation. This is all in a short amount of time here. And Jesus is saying the same thing again. Now he's, he's done a demonstration of sacrificial love. He's taught that lesson. And then he says it again here. He says, little children, yet a little while I am with you. You shall seek me. And as I said unto the, unto the Jews... Where I go, you can't come. So now I say to you, Jesus says, my time's short. Remember, he says, so here's what I have for you. He says, uh, so now I say to you, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. So in light of Jesus' ascension, okay, in light of the short amount of time that, that uh, that Jesus has with his disciples. He's not going to be with them physically anymore. So what does he want them to remember? It's this, he calls it a new commandment. Okay? Now, you guys ever thought about this? Why does Jesus say, a new commandment I give to you? Why is this a new commandment? And let, let me, let me uh, frame the question a little bit more for you. Okay? Because for Israelites... What's, the, what's the, the, the first commandment that Israelites learn, know? What's the most important commandment for, for Israelites? What's that? Um, well, that, that, is, that is right up there. Okay. Uh, and actually, that leads us down the right, down the right road next. Okay. I gotta, let me put this passage up there for you. We won't turn to it. Okay. Actually, yeah. And we'll, we'll go. We'll, we'll go there. Um, this is nothing and, and you would think this is nothing new because yes in Leviticus that's chapter 19 verse 18 Israelites are told the way that you love someone you love your neighbor as yourself so how is what Jesus is saying here how is that different how is this a new commandment he says a new commandment I give to you how is this a new commandment you can kind of find an answer as you Do you want to take a stab at the answer? I love to love others as you do. Ooh. Okay, so you see the difference there? Leighton nailed it. Jesus says, verse 34, look back down. There's a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. It's one thing to love people, to love someone as you love yourself. Isn't it an entirely different thing to love someone as Jesus loves them or as Jesus loves you. It's different because we, we are flawed, we are selfish. Even, you know, even when you think like the concept, you know, like I treat myself better than I treat anybody. I mean, it's kind of a universal human thing in some regard. And that's why it, it, it makes some sense there when you say love others as you love yourself. You take care of yourself. Okay? We feed ourselves. Uh, we, we, but even, okay, you, hopefully you see where the, the analogy goes. Even then, like, we don't love ourselves like Jesus loves us. And so Jesus has given a higher standard, a new commandment of loving. That it's not just love others in a human way, but loving them with Christ's love. Where you can go as low as you need to to love them. Your status can go, or can go as far as Jesus did. And even then, Jesus is going, Jesus gave you, showed the ultimate form of love. 
So there's this new commandment. It's a higher standard. And that's the simple commandment, to love one another. Now, if you notice, uh, again there, it's following that example, following Jesus' example. Think about that. The disciples in, in, in this scenario, in all of Jesus' ministry, think about this. The disciples at times can be thick-headed, they can be prideful, arrogant, unded undedicated, or even traitorous. And Jesus loves them to the fullest. And that's that high standard that he gives for us. Here's what he says in verse 35. This is where we'll end. He says, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. The way people see that we're followers of Christ is how we love others. And that our actions have to match our message. It's not, it's not enough to just be like, okay, if I'm, if I'm a loving person, then that will just draw people to Christ. No, it has to go with our message. But if we have the message without the actions, it does not help anything. It does not draw people to Christ. It does not show people that we're followers of Christ. Our love for others is how people see, how people see Christ's love. By this shall all men Know that ye are my disciples if ye have loved one for another. And so here's the thought that really struck me just from these few verses. Because as John has, has recorded this, I wonder if how often the disciples thought back to this scenario of being in the upper room and thinking on Jesus' final teaching to them and his final teaching on love. They think about it in the context of Jesus loved Judas. Jesus was teaching us, and Judas was there. Jesus, was, there was always that opportunity for Judas to repent. Think about how often Peter thought back to this scenario, and he thought to the words that him and Jesus expressed exchange. And if Peter thought back to yeah, I was so foolish. I thought I was this great follower of Christ, of the Messiah. And I wasn't. And Jesus knew that and he told me he still loved me though. And you come to the end of John and you find throughout the, the New Testament Jesus offered that forgiveness and that friendship back to Peter. I wonder how often Peter thought back to this scenario of in my thick-headedness, in my stupidity, in my arrogance, the Savior was still patient with me. He was still putting up with me. He was still trying to teach me because he loves me. Bring us back to, to where we started. Think back to that person you identified. That person who is hard to love. That's not easy. But we're commanded to. We're commanded to show that person, whoever it was that you're thinking of, that person. God has called us. Jesus has called us and showed us that we are to love whoever that person is. That's tough, right? That's what we're called to do. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you. That you also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, 
if you have love one to another. So I urge you tonight, if you've identified that person, and you've made the Lord's pricking your heart, prompting you on how you need to show love to that person. If you need to get it right with God, get it right with God. If there's actions you need to take with that person, take those actions. Mm -hmm. I, don't have to, I don't have to go step by step by step by step what those are. If you want help, if you want advice, we're, we're here for you. Your parents are here for you. We're called to love and to show Christ in that way with his love. I'll tell you what, I'll give us a, 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 an opportunity to pray, to pray here and then I'll close us. You can stop the recording if you want. Um,